I call the meeting of the Deerfield School Committee to order at 7 o'clock p.m. on August 19th, 2020. I do want to point out to everyone that this meeting is being streamed live and is being recorded. Uh, so we will commence with the agenda. <clears throat> and the first item on the agenda after the call to order is a review and approved minutes of May 13th and June 18th, 2020. This is Trevor McDaniel. I'll make a motion to approve the minutes for Wednesday, May 13th, 2020. Do we have a second? Is that David? Yes. <laughs> Do we have any discussion? I hear no discussion. So all those in favor, roll call vote. Um, David Sharp? Yes. <laughs> Carrie Etchells? Yes. Mary Raymond? Yes. Trevor McDaniel? Yes. And Ken Cutterback? Yes. It's unanimous. Make a motion to approve the minutes for Thursday, June 18th, 2020. Do we have a second? Second. Carrie Etchells? Care, I thought that was Carrie, so. All right, any discussion on this? Hearing no discussion, all those in, oh, not all those in favor, <laughs> roll call vote, David Sharp? Yes. Carrie Etchells? Yes. Mary Raymond? Yes. Trevor McDaniel? Yes. And Ken Cutterback, yes, it is unanimous also. So that takes care of the minutes at this point in time. And we are up to the financial statement. Okay. Uh, so first thing we're going to talk about is the warrants that were signed electronically. So we had a batch of warrants in July that were for fiscal year 20. There were eight warrants totaling $49,916.42. And we had two batches of warrants signed for fiscal year 21 already in August. The first contained five warrants for $13,685.32, and the second had three warrants totaling $51,161.33. So thank you, school committee, for reviewing and signing those electronically. Um, Ken, I did send out this report um, to school committee today, so you should be able to pull those numbers right. directly from the report. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> And I do apologize for not getting it out to you sooner. I worked as quickly as I could this week with all of the meetings that we had. So um, I got it out to you as soon as I could today. In the future, I'll, I'll aim to do I, better and get it to you early. I think given the circumstances and the fact that we are able to review the warrants now um, online and before we sign them, it, it makes things much more efficient. So it's... I, yeah, no need for an apology, especially given this special summer that you're having in that in the offices. So, Great. thank you very much for the for the information. I've had a chance just to glance at the uh, financial report. So, um, <clears throat> so thank you again. Any yep. any other news? Well, I, I did want to go over the um, finances that I reported on in that report for this meeting. Sure, um, absolutely. There's a, lot, there's a lot of information to take in. Um, I'll try to talk as clearly and precisely as I can, but move quickly so that we don't hold up the rest of the meeting. Um, but what I'm going to do is first talk about fiscal year 21, how the general fund wrapped up in all of our revolving funds. Then, or, I'm sorry, fiscal year 20. Uh, then I'll go into talking about fiscal year 21, what those revolving funds look like at this point, given the revenue and expenditures, and then we'll close out by talking about the grants that are available to Deerfield Elementary for COVID-related expenditures. So we met about three months ago. Uh, that's the last big financial update that you received. And at that time, we thought we had about 115,000 remaining to be spent in the general fund. Uh, we estimated that we would spend, or I estimated, I should say, that we would spend around $94,000. Uh, and it left very little money remaining in Deerfield's general fund budget, uh, around $20,000, which it was agreed upon that we would 
and um, allocate that for the one-to-one -one technology initiative so that we could put that money towards more Chromebook purchases for students. Um, the, any remaining funds, if any beyond that, were to be reallocated from school choice so that we could put money back into school choice in support of the level funded budget for fiscal year 21. Well, I'm happy to report that my estimating was completely off. Um, we actually had more money available than I anticipated. And we ended up doing a transfer of $195,000 $195, from the general fund back to school choice for use for this year and years in the future. Uh, and that Chromebook purchase was also covered by the town funding for the Municipal, Municipal Cares Act grant. Um, so we ended up with quite a, quite a bit of money going back into school choice. So, you know, I have to thank Tina and the other staff who are responsible for spending at the school level for really taking the budget freeze seriously um, and really keeping expenses down to a minimum in that last six weeks of school. So uh, thank you for that. Any questions before I continue? No. Uh, just one question on the uh, Chromebook purchase. Have we heard anything about delivery? Any, any no. updates on it? Okay, that's all. No, just a curiosity last, question. Yeah, last I had heard they were on back order and I think um, one of the other principals had heard maybe November they would be here. And I'm sure um, Darius or Tina could talk more about the existing Chromebook state, regardless of that delivery, if, if you guys okay. want that information. All right. So thank you. Okay. So moving on. Um, so the school choice analysis. Uh, there is some bad news here. While we ended out in the general fund positive and were able, able to move money back, School choice revenue was $113,000 less than we anticipated. School choice numbers are based on your end of the prior year numbers. And unfortunately, when the budget was built going into fiscal year 20, the counts were not necessarily um, looked at very closely, the counts of students. And our enrollment in FY20 dropped compared to FY19. So what DESE does is they base your 20 funding based on the prior year and in June, then they make an adjustment if, you're, if, you, if you've if you been overpaid or underpaid. And we had been overpaid in the prior year, so they adjusted down our school choice revenue by $113,000. It's very unfortunate, but not much we can do about it at this point. The good news is that expenses were significantly lower because we had um, the reallocation from general fund, but we also had some payroll expenses that were lower than we had budgeted for school choice. So we ended up with a net increase over the projected numbers of roughly $100,000 over what we anticipated. And uh, the school choice revolving fund is right around a million dollars, which is pretty close to where we started last school year at. Um, so we're still in a really healthy shape, which is great news because we are going to have some hardships to consider for FY21 from um, COVID-related tuition and uh, revenue losses. Um, I'm going to move on from there to the early childhood revolving. This was an account that we also discussed in May. We knew that we were going to have tuition reductions because we were not charging tuition during the COVID closure. Uh, so that revenue was down about 27000 Good news there is our salaries and expenditures were lower than budgeted. We didn't have as many expenses in those last few weeks of school. We didn't have uh, the June summer staffing to pay for out of this count like we do normally. Um, so we still ended in a positive note, and currently the end of year balance is about $18,500. The special education revolving fund is the next fund that we're going to talk about. Uh, revenue was exactly as we budgeted it, but expenditures were slightly less. Uh, so this resulted in an increase in revenue of around 15,000. And going into fiscal year 21, the special education revolving account has approximately $82,000 in support of future years. The final fund that we're going to talk about to close out FY20 is the school lunch revolving analysis. 
Again, another account we discussed in May, this fund had a revenue loss because we were giving free and reduced, or I'm sorry, free lunches to um, not just existing students, but siblings. Um, anyone really who wanted it could come, which was great. We could offer that to our community. However, it did mean that we had a decrease in revenue. We did get some reimbursement from the government, but it was um, certainly not where we expected things to be. The net profit and loss for the year was a loss of about $13,000 in the school lunch program. Thankfully, there was a good beginning balance and we're ending the year with almost $26,000 going into fiscal year 21. Any questions about the 20 summaries or any of those revolving funds? One, just one question. Was there um, any way that, um, so the, did the, could the CARES Act help cover some of that funding? I know that the towns paid a little bit for the senior food, but it was just cost, so we probably lost money on that too. And I just can't thank you enough. I really, on behalf of our seniors, I can't thank you enough for what the school did to step up and is still doing, providing lunches and breakfast and stuff for our seniors. Um, it's just been a huge help and such a, um, even just a social where they can come and get food, um, it means the world to them. And just to get out and be able to get something and have some food and a breakfast for the next morning, it's been tremendously positive. Um, wonderful thing that the school has done. I just didn't know if there was a, a way to recoup some of that from CARES Act or any other. So unfortunately there is not. Um, the good news with the school lunch program is that DESE reimbursed regardless of if the student or family was a free or reduced lunch eligible. So we did see some income from families who wouldn't normally get free or reduced lunch. Yep. Um, the way that the grants that we've received so far are written they can't be used to offset lost revenue in any kind of revolving fund. They also cannot be used for any um, expenses that are budgeted already. So yeah. all of these things that happened last year, unfortunately, we can't do that. Okay. The other thing that we try to avoid with, and these are all considered grants, and one thing that we try to avoid with grants is um, there is a requirement with Mass Teachers Association, or I'm, I'm sorry, Mass um, Retirement System to pay 9% of any salary that is paid from a grant into the teacher retirement. So grant funding is limited and we try not to lose that 9% of that salary on top of it from a grant. So we try to do non-salary related expenditures or stipends because stipends are not pensionable. Right. And unfortunately, no, we can't recoup any of that from COVID funding. Okay. Just, just curious. Sure. Okay, thank you. Anything else on 20 before I continue on? No. Okay. Um, so 21, I did send you the general fund uh, July expense report. I didn't send you the school choice numbers yet because I'm still uploading the budget based on what we agreed upon and then some additional expenses that we're going to talk about here. But I, I sent you the July report for general fund. There's nothing concerning. Um, the only account that I'm really keeping an eye on at this point, if you look at that report, Function code, I believe it's 4220 under buildings and maintenance. The line for general repairs is already used at about 40%. So that flagged me that we're, you know, a month in the school um, and we've already used that amount. And what I've learned in conversation with our facilities director is that we pay for the energy management system expenditure out of that line, which is about $7,300. So I think moving forward, that's something that we're going to want to talk about if we want to move that money to a different or that expense to a different line so that the expense that's meant for building, building repairs, the budget that's meant for building repairs actually can repair the building. This is more of a maintenance program. Mm -hmm. They come in and, you know, assess it and fix it if needed, but it's a lot of money to take right off the top July 1 from our repairs line. So just something to think about moving forward. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so we're going to move on here to fiscal year 21 school choice. Um, so in the report that I gave you, there was total expenditures of 460,000. That includes 45,000 for COVID related expenditures that were not budgeted when we built the budgets in the spring. Um, the, that money has not been spent yet. I only have it in there as a placeholder at this point. 
in the event that we use all of the grant funding, this gives us something guaranteed to fall back on that we're not gonna use for any other need and really hold that money in a safe spot for us. So I wanted you to know that I added those funds in there for COVID expenditures. The other challenge here with School Choice for 21 is we took a hit in 20, um, as I explained previously with the enrollment and the tuition, we're gonna take an additional hit in 21. Tina looked very closely at the roster for the end of 20 that the DESE would use to project our 21 revenues. And the kids coming in do not offset the kids going out. So we're looking at a $65,000 loss in school choice for 21 as well. So between the two years, um, we're down quite a bit of money in school choice. It's a uh, I think about $110,000 less between the two years from what we had planned on. Um, and we're looking at ending the year, even with those expenses, right around 900,000 as it stands right now. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna be completely honest that we're gonna need that money for additional expenses. Mm -hmm. You'll learn more as I continue through, but we have some um, tough position we're in with a couple of these revolving funds. Okay. Uh, so as it stands right now, good spot, but more to be discussed. Mm -hmm. Early childhood revolving is one of the accounts, you know, the funds that we need to pay attention to. Shelly, can I ask oh, you David, go ahead. Yes, of course. Yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, no problem. You just said something that confused me a little bit. Um, you, you talked about the outflow of choice money and the inflow based on students coming and going from our sure. district. But we don't account for that in our school choice fund on this paper, do we? Because I thought the outgoing- so let, me, let me clarify that. But what I'm referring to is the students who choice in who are leaving Deerfield Elementary, whether they're sixth graders and graduated or they moved on. I'm not referring to the receive of yeah. uh, the sending students out of district. Mm -hmm. Gotcha, I missed that, sorry, okay. No, no problem, that's a good point of clarification. Yeah, okay. Okay, early childhood uh, revolving fund. So uh, revenues were down from last year, even though we are starting off the year with almost $20,000 in existing revenue. Um, our projections for this year are significantly lower than what we went into the budget planning process with. We're looking at an enrollment of only 14 students and not all of those students would be paying tuition um, because our special education students, we have to offer free services to. So we're only looking at $14,000 in revenue. Um, and that's certainly significantly less than what we would have planned for our preschool programs in Deerfield. Um, expenses do not change, however, even though our tuition source is going down. We still need the same teachers. We have IAs planned. Um, so we're looking at at the end of 21, the way the budget is built right now, a loss in the early childhood program of $122,000. So this is where I was saying, we're going to need that school choice money. Um, it's a, you know beyond a bummer that our student count is down and we're, we're losing revenue, but we're starting off good and we've still got a good amount in there. Are we seeing that, um, and, and maybe Tina could answer this too, that are we seeing the low number of students signed up um, based on just the uh, number of kids available or based on COVID? I don't, I don't want to speak too much about the number of kids signed up because I can't speak to that. But what I know about this budget is that we have a limited capacity that we can take for preschool kids based because on facing and stuff. ABC and DESE regulations. Yeah. Right. Got it. Okay. I don't, I don't think it has anything to do with the kids that wanted to come to school. Right. We could take a lot more. If we, There's a lot more people that want to come. We just don't have the space to be able to do exactly. it. Exactly. New environment. Okay. Yep. All right. That's so um, we are going to have to make some decisions on where to pay this staffing from. Um, we, we could, look at the general fund and see what position vacancies we have there because we do have some position vacancies there. Tina may need to fill some of those, but um, we've kind of been holding off on hiring at this point. Uh, so her and I will have to have some discussions about that, or we could always use the school choice funds, which thank goodness we have available to us. 
Um, long term, this is not just a problem for fiscal year 21. This is a problem for 22 and beyond because if we don't um, replenish this fund in any way, all of these expenditures are gonna have to continue to be paid from a different revenue source. And we do not know what enrollment looks like for uh, next school year, which seems far away, but in reality, it's not. And it's things that we need to start thinking about. So, and, and if we don't have, if we're still limited by the space, that doesn't change. Um, no, un unless something changes with the guidelines, you know, if we get a vaccine and, right. and we can increase numbers, yeah, we, we could be in the same predicament next school year. If we had a bigger room, like if we, if just hypothetically, we dropped a gigantic size room there, do we, would we be able to bring in more people? It really has to do with the room and the space, right? Yeah. Yes. Trevor, it's Tina. I have to um, keep my camera off because my internet is a little spotty where I am. Yep. It also has to do with um, the model two, like half days and um, and the availability of families that are able to join in on our schedule, if you will. So yeah. I'm sure it's very convenient for them. Right. If we were full time, it'd be a lot different. Right. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. Any other questions about early childhood before I continue on? No, nope, that was good. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so special education revolving fund. Uh, revenue is as we anticipate based on the budget in the spring. There's not a whole lot to report here. Um, we are expending out more than we're bringing in. However, we're starting with 82,000. So we're looking at ending the year, assuming no changes, which we always know that this is one of those kind of uh, uh, funds that fluctuates based on the needs of the community. Um, but we're looking at about $70,000 remaining in the special education fund at the end of FY21. So and nothing terrible to report there. <laughs> quick, quick question though. There was a, a concern with a possible out of district placement. Is that no longer a concern or um, for special education? Yeah, Ken, I don't think that's a, any longer a concern. I think okay. they're housing that Thank too. Thank you. Okay, good. Just wanted to check. Okay, uh, school lunch revolving is the last we're going to discuss for fiscal year 21 at this time. Uh, as I said earlier, we're starting 21 with almost $26,000. Like the early childhood uh, revolving fund, school lunch is going to be problematic for Deerfield Elementary. Uh, we, again, don't know what meals are going to look like. Um, even with students returning to school in the hybrid model, we're not sure how many are actually gonna choose to have school lunch versus bringing their own. Um, DESE could also change the plans. They could extend this waiver where they're offering free lunches to everyone for a longer amount of time. Um, there's a lot up in the air with this, but right now we still have $56,000 in salaries and wages that we need to pay from the school lunch revolving fund plus food costs and overhead for that program. So just looking at wages, we would be at a loss by the end of the year of $25,000. So as we discussed with um, early childhood, we are gonna need to have some other funding sources and make some decisions on where to pay our school lunch staff moving forward. And I'll have more information on that. You know, Mary and I are in close communication about you know, what do we need for staffing? What are we thinking we need for food? And, you know, it, it's been difficult because the plans keep changing and evolving day by day and uh, sometimes hour by hour. And, you know, we're doing the best that we can to come up with numbers. I think probably we're going to be into um, at least mid-October before we have a real idea of what the revenue is going to look like in this account, if not a little bit longer than that. Um, and, you know, I, I, we're going to have to just move some things around based on the, the existing issues we have with the finances for school lunch. Any questions about that? Okay, so I, I mean, I think that we've had to take in some difficult news today. I think um, we anticipated that this was going to be a challenge. Um, certainly not the best position we want to be in in some of these revolving funds that do support our faculty and staff. 
but at the same time, I'm glad that we do have resources from um, school choice to be able to help support these programs. And again, that long-term discussion is something we're gonna have to continue for future years. Mm -hmm. okay. <clears throat> so the final, oh, Ken, do you have anything on that before I talk about the grant funding? No, I, I'm in complete agreement. I just think we're in, you know, we're in such uncharted waters here that uh, the plan that you've outlined to me and the, the level of detail you've given us is very reassuring. Mm -hmm. um, we know we've got some funds that we can use to cover these, uh, these uncertainties for this year. And it looks like for the foreseeable uh, fiscal year following uh, when hopefully things will start to clarify and the, the waters won't be quite as money, muddy um, so that planning for school years will be a little bit easier than it's obviously been during this time frame. So the, the work you, you and your staff are doing is phenomenal, Shelley. We thank you for that. So. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, quickly I'll close out with the grant information related to COVID-19. So Deerfield Elementary at this time is receiving roughly $162,000 in grant funding. Uh, the first source of, of uh, funding for this was from the Municipal CARES Act that we submitted expenditures for in fiscal year 20. We put in for $65,500 in technology for the one-to-one -one initiative, and that has been fully funded. I'm, I'm happy to report, Casey did let me know that we received all of our funding there. There's another small amount of money coming uh, from that first funding source for PPE and sanitation equipment. Then we have a second grant from elementary and secondary education. It's an emergency relief fund. Uh, the, the award for this was based on Title I funding. So Deerfield is receiving $26,651. This has been um, intended to be for COVID related expenses. However, if we are in a situation where we do need to fund something that was previously budgeted, we can use it for things that would normally qualify under Title I. However, we are trying to keep it COVID related because the amount of expenditures is, you know, more than we can even think about every day something new comes up. Uh, and the last grant so far for COVID relief is a coronavirus relief fund, also through DESE. Uh, what they did was award an additional $225 per student based on foundation enrollment, which is our Deerfield students, Deerfield residents. Uh, so that awarded Deerfield Elementary $69,751. So of that 162,000, we've spent around 81 and have about 81 and a half-ish left to spend. Um, so what we will do is spend down all of the grant money. Uh, I will be meeting with Tina in the coming week, if not two weeks, uh, to plan out the rest of that spending to make sure that we're utilizing that money to the greatest potential. And then from there, we have that $45,000 that is earmarked in school choice. Okay. Any grant yeah. questions or COVID questions in general? <laughs> <laughs> Related to finances. <laughs> Yeah, careful what you ask for. <laughs> I know. <laughs> uh, so. No. Okay. Good job. Thank you. No. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you, Shelly. <clears throat> and as I said, thank you. Thank you to your team, please. Let them know our, uh, our appreciation. Mm -hmm. So um, at this point in time, we we're moving on the agenda to public comment. And uh, just as a as a heads up, if, if there are people, and we have about 79 people participating at this point in time, and roughly 65 or six of them would be um, the general public, I think. So if you have a desire to make a public comment at this stage, I ask you to do want to uh, please raise your hand on the chat, uh, in the chat area, and just say, you're interested in, in commenting, and I will recognize people in order as they come. We ask that you only use the chat area to raise your hand. We don't want dialogue taking place as, after people or as people are making their comments, and uh, that is not the, not the purpose. 
when you when you're recognized i will call your name and you will have two minutes to comment um and we will try and stick to about a two two minute timeline and uh go from there so please as i said raise your hand in the um area so i see andrea callahan has raised the hand twice uh but i figured that was the the intent the first time around so andrea callahan if you know how to unmute, please unmute and we'll take your comment. Track. You're there. Hi. Hi. I'm Andrea Hello. Callahan. Hi. I'm an IA at Deerfield Elementary. I've been there about seven, eight years. I have a master's degree. I make $18 an hour. I, when you look at me, I don't know if you can see me. Um, I am the face of COVID and your employee. Last February, mid-February, a child who had just gotten off a plane who was very, very sick sneezed on the side of my face. I ran in the bathroom. I put soap, tried to get it off. Eight days later, I got sick. And on March 9th, I was diagnosed with COVID. Um, at my doctor's office and my son. By then he had caught it too. For two months, I was really, really, really sick. Um, I should have been hospitalized, but I couldn't because I'm a single mom of a kid with autism and epilepsy. And so the doctors agreed to check in twice a day. They gave me nebulizer, prednisone, rescue inhaler, emergency inhaler, 20 days of prednisone all sorts of meds and by the skin of my teeth I was able to stay home but I coughed up blood I vomited um, there were days I laid in my vomit because I couldn't get I was, couldn't change today I went to my physical appointment and I found out that my doctor told me 70% of the people my age who have COVID end up with structural heart abnormalities so now I'm getting um, checked for an enlarged heart. I continue to cough all night and a lot of the day. Um, and I'm having, I have pains in my right, my right lung. So they're going to screen. I have a long history of pneumonia. I already had scar tissue. And so now they're going to screen me for lung um, damage as well. You didn't know. School committee, Darius, you didn't know about this back in February and March, but you know about it now. I don't want to see my coworkers go through this because there was one night where I was gasping for breath. I was in respiratory distress and I was pretty close. And I don't, I don't want to see children go through this. I don't want to be organizing pictures of staff people, my coworkers, my friends, and students, children that I love and care for. I don't want to be organizing photos of them on flags on people's lawns to honor them from COVID-20. So it's, it's, your, it's your turn. Do the right thing. I'm the face of COVID. My life is different now. I hope I get good news. I'll know in five weeks. Mm -hmm. so. okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Andrea. I'm I'm so sorry to hear of everything that you've had to endure um, during this pandemic. It's as you as you point out, it's it's just un unbelievable what can what can happen. Um, so, Sean Sean Durrett would be next. Yeah, thank you. Hi, my name is Sean Durrett, and I am a parent of a rising fifth grader at Deerfield Elementary, and I have another child who just graduated from sixth grade at DES. Andrea, thank you for being brave enough to share your story with this wider group. Um, I also work as a teacher and a school administrator in Greenfield, and I'm here to speak up in support of the excellent DES educators and staff. 
I trust the professionalism, the work ethic, and the expertise of all of our DES teachers. And as a parent, I'm deeply concerned about employee morale if our teachers are not validated and respected as the experts in their field. I urge the school committee to do everything they can to listen to and support our teachers, whether the concerns are individual or collective through the union negotiation. Thank you for your time and for your service on the school committee. Thank you, Sean. And uh, I, I, I would also take this opportunity to thank you for the correspondence you have been sending in as well. So, um, Aja, I think I pronounced it right this time. Aja Cerrone. You did. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I'm Aja Cerrone, and I co-chair the CPAC. We wanted to start by thanking the administrators and principals for adjusting the reopening plans to follow both the CPAC's recommendations and the guidance put out by DESE on special education. The slower phased reopening with special education coming in first gives the most vulnerable students a chance to adjust to the new environment this fall. CPAC families are thankful for this consideration. We deeply appreciate your change of course to include more students in the high needs category as well and not just the substantially separate IEP students that was initially presented at the Sunderland meeting last week. Having adaptive PPE available to special education students and staff, along with the options for a temporary shift to substantially separate classrooms, increases the safety for our neediest students. Providing the proposed technology options will improve special education students' ability to access content in both models. The CPAC values the assurances that the district will be able to quickly remedy the backlog of IEP evaluations and annual meetings from last year, complete all of the upcoming annual meetings, and any amendment meetings that are requested this fall, in addition to providing IEP evaluations to students who are suspected of having new disabilities, like anxiety or depression resulting from the pandemic. We are hopeful that the information provided in the past four school committee meetings will be compiled into a special education fact sheet and readily available to families as quickly as possible. Because as all CPAC parents know, nothing is guaranteed until we have it in writing. Thank you all for your time. Thank you, Asia, and thank you to uh, CPAC and all the concerned families in that organization for your your vocal and uh, you know well-intended feedback to us on our reopening plans. So um, I believe that is it for our public comment at this point in time. So with that being said, we will move to new business. The latest update on state guidance for community data metrics for COVID safe schools. And I believe Mr. Modesto. Yes, sir. Um, I'm going to have um, our nurse leader, Meg Birch, kind of give the overview of our matrix that we've been putting together. For those of you who are on other calls, you've probably seen this before, but um, not this committee. So here we go. Um, I'm going to present her, her brief uh, slideshow. Hi there. So um, these are metrics that um, we have been working on. Um, this presentation incorporates uh, what has been provided to us from the state, um, and you know, in, later in the in the presentation, I'll I'll address this. But I want to just be clear that decisions um, were based on these data will be made. Um, by the Board of Health in consultation with the district um, and where appropriate with other local boards of health as we move uh, as, as, yeah, uh, that's it. So um, I'm starting all of my um, presentations just with this sort of reminder um, because these really are the key um, components for health and safety for all of us in any setting that we're in. Um, it really is masks when you're outside of the home, maintaining physical distancing, um, hand hygiene and then staying home if you're unwell. Um, so I just, I like to start with those. That's it. <laughs> um, in, in trying to, um, in, in working on our data metrics, um, those of you who have seen other pre discussions and our, on our draft protocols, these, these have changed. Um, 
there are a lot of data out there and it seemed important to narrow down the data that we were going to rely on um, and also make sure that that data um, were readily available and um, you know easily interpretable um, so we have two source two um, dashboard points from the Department of Public Health, their weekly um, data and um, their daily data. And I'll talk more about what we pull from those um, sources. Uh, the New York Times has an interactive map. It counts that are uh, county le level data. Um, and the Harvard Global Health Institute has an interactive dashboard as well. Um, that has county level data, including counts that um, we can use to calculate some of our metrics. Um, so the, these next two slides are kind of a snapshot of what the state released um, last Tuesday for their color coded metrics. Um, these are uh, these are based on um, average daily cases per hundred thousand, um, and that's a rolling average over fourteen days. These data are updated by the state every Wednesday, um, and are shown on a, on a map that is available um, in the weekly report, and also lower down on that same page. Um, and uh, they've added an interactive piece to that map that you can hover over a town and get more details about um, the statistics for that town. Um, as you can see, you know, the, the, they're looking at anything greater than eight per 100,000. Um, red, four to eight yellow, less than four is green. Their unshaded part of the map is, um, it's a different statistic that they're presenting on the same map, which is fewer than five total cases over the past 14 days. And they see that as relevant, and it is relevant for smaller communities with small populations and very few cases. Um, but, um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Next. I set my timer and I'm trying not to go down the rabbit holes that I can easily go down on with this data. Um, so I want to be clear that this slide is showing their recommendations. The guidance from DESE and the, and the command center are that greater than eight cases per 100,000 would um, indicate remote learning. Between four and eight would be uh, hybrid or remote, um, remote if there were extenuating circumstances. And four, they say full in-person or hybrid. Again, um, hybrid would be extenuating circumstances, which they, they don't define, though they do refer to uh, local boards of health, looking at other data, looking at trend data um, to make appropriate decisions. Um, and, you know, I, I think it, no, there's not been any discussion where we've been talking that I'm aware of this district of full remote. So that's I, I unbolded them in my presentation because they're really not part of our discussion at this time. Um, so when I was when I was looking at the data that we had, when I was looking at the data that were available for the state, it seemed important to sort of rank them. Uh, the primary indicators are going to be ones that uh, could trigger a 14-day closure without question. Those are data um, by the Department of Public Health. It's statewide or regional data based on large uh, numbers um, and fairly stable. Um, indicators, um, that's gonna be local or regional data. It would, they would, they would likely trigger a short-term closure to allow the Board of Health, um, the district um, to do additional assessment um, and, and seek additional data. Um, Last category is I, I named tertiary indicators. So those are things that would trigger, you know, would trigger a level of concern. And so that would be a conversation with the local board of health, whether um, one town, the four towns, you know, likely given our district, um, and also regional data. Um, and it would again be um, an opportunity to sort of reassess and look at the whole picture um, to determine what's next. So specifically, the primary indicators are, um, we would be looking at that um, DPH uh, metric, um, red, 
yellow, green. We would be looking at um, the seven day weighted average of positive tests that's available in the daily dashboard. It's supposed to be updated by four each day. Um, it's currently 1.4% for the state. Um, and then we are waiting for DPH uh, and DESE <coughs> um, regional data. And I'm involved in a number of advocacy efforts um, as are many public health nurses and others to, um, to get regional data, so to get county level data, um, to get school district level data so that we could have aggregate data. The one um, about their color-coded metric is um, when you're looking at the, the population, you know, counts per 100,000 population, um, they don't report numbers for towns um, below a certain population. And those numbers really are meant for larger um, municipalities. Um, and, um, so so we, we, we often don't get the data that those, um, and, there, and we have small numbers, so it just makes it less stable. Um, there's 70,000 people in Franklin County, so, um, Calculate something for Deerfield is is not not a, not so appropriate. Secondary indicators. Um, so this is something we can calculate from the data reported um, in the weekly report. The confirmed COVID cases in the previous fourteen days, um, looking at less than twenty five for the entire county, um, so the twenty six towns, and that would include data from settings that are really um, contain discrete congregate settings, such as a skilled nursing facility, um, Franklin County Jail. Um, schools, I would, would not be excluded from that count. Um, generally, certainly public schools, day schools would not be. Um, percent positive, less than 3% for Franklin County. We can calculate that again using the DPH data. 3% uh, is the recommendation, recommended threshold by the Harvard Global Health Institute um, and seems for our, at a local level, more appropriate um, given our population and our rural connected communities. And then doing a combined Franklin and Hampshire uh, data um, looking at less than 10 cases per day or 70 cases per week per 100,000 population, again, excluding congregate uh, settings. Um, and that data, um, that those numbers, threshold numbers are based on the Harvard Global Health Institute um, report. So the tertiary indicators um, that were, were or wanting to work with or looking at trends. Um, so, you know, are there, are there increasing trends in our primary or our secondary data? Um, you know, it's important to note that if we see, um, you know, case numbers across the state are increasing, um, you know, it's, it's going to impact uh, our decision um, that trend will impact our decision and, and we wouldn't, uh, I don't imagine, wait to hit 5% if the trend is clearly headed that direction. Uh, internal monitoring of data would be uh, looking at illness dismissals within a building. 1.9% um, of the expected census um, and 1.9 is the baseline for influenza-like illnesses for the 2019-2020 uh, flu season for New England. Um, it's just it's a way that um, public health data are um, it's a measure to to monitor uh, an uptick in illnesses that are not uh, necessarily diagnosed. So it's it's a flag for us. Um, and then also a greater than 10% of the um, expected. Uh, census any given day, and that would be staff and students if they're out, that that would be a flag that would, um, would trigger a conversation and an assessment of other data. And then, you know, if we're hearing from the local board of health, um, either for Deerfield or our surrounding towns, our district towns or other Franklin County towns, 
that they're seeing um, increased positive test results in our area. Um, that would be information that would um, would definitely trigger a conversation um, and a reassessment of um, the situation. And then the closure scenarios, these decisions are made by the local Board of Health. Um, I want to acknowledge that we have um, Board of Health members on this call and I appreciate your taking the time, making the time to be here. Um, so a long-term closure, um, you know, greater than 14 days, um, that, that would be when there's widespread transmission in the community. The primary indicators remain above the threshold uh, levels with no, uh, no sort of flattening of the curve or decrease of trend. A 14-day district or building closure, um, that would be where we're seeing, again, community spread we have concern um, for uh, that there was an uh, instance of in-school transmission. Um, and then it, once the district closed, it would only reopen if the primary indicators were below the threshold and the Board of Health felt that um, the other measures were, um, they felt comfortable with what else they were seeing in terms of the data and as much as we uh, are able to, um, from conversations with with surrounding towns and um, and districts, and then the short term closures were look would be sort of a one to three or a three to five day uh, closure, and that's that's really to sort of basically put the brakes on and do a full assessment of the data, see what's happening, um, get the information needed to make an appropriate decision about the next step, whether the school would reopen after that short-term closure or remain closed, um, would be determined by the local Board of Health. Um, they could decide to, ex to extend that closure for 14 days or longer uh, if the data indicated that was the appropriate safe decision to make for our communities. It. I almost got it under 10 minutes, Darius. Thanks, Meg. You're muted, sir. Sorry about that. Do we have any questions from committee members? Concerning the numbers. Um, I, I, I don't have any comments at this point in time, so. <clears throat> I don't, I don't, this is Trevor McDaniel. I, I just really wanted to thank Meg and, and everybody that she's been working with, um, all the local boards of health to try and come up with kind of really succinct plan on how we would look at closures or openings and all the indicators we'd be looking at. And it's a, it's an Im immense amount of work that, um, that Meg and everybody has been doing to try and find you know, the right mix of things to be looking at and following. And I just thank you so much for all that, all that work. Okay. Yes. Yes, Meg. Thank you. Thank you. So, so, um, next we would have planning and scheduling for hybrid and remote models on the agenda. Yeah. So, uh, that brings me back in. Um, so basically you're, you're the, um, I think you're the last school committee to be unveiling of this. And so that for, when we start going to individual school committees, that's how information unfortunately gets kind of rolled out. Um, right now, uh, basically I met with the, uh, I have trouble spitting this out every time, probably because it's you know not news that I want to be sending out. Um, I met with the administrative team early on Monday and basically we kind of mapped out the timelines in order to get things rolling. And I really need to, to slow down our slow rollout of the hybrid model. Um, basically what, what I'm asking for is to move forward with a two week remote to start. Um, the reasons on that is you know, there, there are several. Um, the first one being uh, there was concerns from the Board of Health starting that, that, that particular week, following um, the Labor Day weekend. <coughs> really, we've seen the uptick after the last major late holiday weekend and just open up schools on that particular weekend with all the other anxieties about opening up school um, you know, I was asked if I could push it off a few days. Um, on top of that, we've had, you know, I am negotiating with the union and also working on accommodations for staff members. And that process is taking longer to communicate out to what accommodations can be made, 
staff members applying for different accombinations and working that. We both lost for Meg by a long yeah. shot, and I am so grateful. <laughs> I took care of her. Um, so, <laughs> thanks, Kim. So, um, hey, Kim. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> so, so that being, you kind of brought some humor to it. Thank you. Um, so the, um, and basically, you know, trying to work those things out. We're also getting our buildings ready and in working with different contractors and the timelines on that. Um, there's a lot of different things having to come together perfectly at the right time. Um, you know, me at myself as the leader of this district, I, you know, I put a timeline at the beginning of August that um, I thought we could make. Um, I think I was being ambitious and going to the buffet line, um, you know, with, with big eyes that we could pull this off. There's just a lot of, a lot of factors, a lot of human factors as well, where you can't just, it can't just get it done. You can't roll it out like we do every school year. Um, and so that's, you know, the, my reason for a recommendation of, you know, slowing it down. Um, I, I was going to have Kim jump on just, I'm gonna, I was going to present what the slowdown model looks like. Um, and um, if you'll, indulge with that and Kim will, we'll, we'll go through it rather quickly because I know it's getting now that was what I just showed that just shows you how tired I am let's not do that let's talk <laughs> about the slowdown model here all right can we see that instead no not yet <laughs> guys you know what I've you know I've only done about 12 hours of school committee this week so <laughs> if you think I'm joking I'm not all right so here we are Thank you, Darius. Do you mind just making, oh, it's perfect. I can see it perfectly. <laughs> there we go. I made it bigger already. There we go. It's just perfect. So yes, Darius uh, talked about slowing this down a little bit by a two week period of time. And this uh, is the draft schedule for this. So if you take a look at August 26th, those in that pink color are the 10 days that we're giving to the teachers for professional development. And there's a lot of different trainings going on that day. And um, there's events being made. So those are the first 10 days that brings us to September 9th. Then the official first day of school is on September 10th. And as Darius mentioned, given the holiday on Labor Day, it was recommended to us to do those first days in terms of remote orientations. So those two days in green will both be um, orientations for students and families to become used to the newness of our school. Then here's the week that Darius is really talking about. It's September 14th through the 18th. And those will be full remote days for most students. And we're asking our special program students and our high needs students to start on those days in a half day program. Down the center of the color, you're gonna see this the center of the calendar, you're going to see a purple blocks. Those Wednesdays will be remote days for all students for a half day model. And in the afternoon, we'll have staff professional development. And as you can tell, and we've been talking a lot about it. There's a lot of professional development that needs to be done. That following week, it's uh, we're adding more of the vulnerable learners, so that's that kind of orangey salmon color there. So we're, we're able to address the needs of the most vulnerable learners. And as you know, the definition for vulnerable learners is, is wider than just students and IEPs. And Tina and her staff are really looking at who's coming in on those days. Then on the 24th, we get to start that schedule that we originally planned for you. So that was that two week time. And those that's when we start cohort A and cohort B. In the beginning, we would like half the children in cohort A to come in one day, half the children in cohort B, and then the other half on the 28th and 29th. And to do that, we can really get to know the kids, re-meet, um, re re-be together, do the social emotional check in. We haven't seen these children in a long time and a lot of things have happened and we want to be able so we can connect personally to do our responsive classrooms and just to really be there for each other. Then on that blue box that October 1st, that's when um, we have that cohort A, cohort B back and forth. And those are colored blue because as you know, we're trying to go from the half day model to the full day based on um, the gates being open. So the calendar runs that way all the way through with every other day 
with Wednesdays off. Um, and then obviously we heard a lot about the health indicators and when we can open the gates to, to make, help us make the decisions for that. So that's the main changes in the calendar and the slowdown that includes both a remote start as well as increased opportunities for um, our special population students. Thank you, Kim. You're welcome. Darius, did you question, have one? Any questions regarding that? That you know, so basically, our timing. I, I, once, once we kind of release this, then we've had parents asking, you know, what's this mean, and what's the rollout of this. So basically, my my rollout of this is to be is presenting it to, to the school committees. We also sent it on to teachers yesterday. It is like we're creating the documentation as fast as we're we're beating it out. You know what I mean? And just as you probably probably heard, you heard about maybe last night when I got it ready for school committee for the met last night. Um, Frontier is also doing the same thing, but they're doing a different kind of rollout. They have different parameters and that kind of thing, um, different you know students and that, kind of, that sort of thing. So that's the idea. Um, our game plan to communicate with parents is, is going to be, um, you know, we're working it through with teachers right now, kind of, kind of run it by school committee as well. Um, and, and by early next week, getting those calendars out and additional information to parents about um, you know, the following, you know, for this year coming up. So I do, you know, I know parents are anxious to get their schedules set. Um, um, and I, I apologize. We're, we're we're going as fast as we can, um, you know, to schedule all these things. There's a lot of different moving parts, you know, and um, to get students back in the building and create a hybrid model, which is you know I've been I've been pushing forward. Um, <clears throat> we also have to create a remote model at the same time, so we're creating two teaching models at the same time, and you know, um, without a whole lot of increase in staffing. So it's working with staff and to create those kind of things. It's complicated, and so. Um, and it's a lot of work ahead of us there. So. Yes. Well, I, I know that back when we took our vote, Darius, thank you. Um, continued thanks to you, your administrative team, to the faculty and staff that are working hand in hand with you to uh, develop these various models and, and plans. But I know that back when we took the vote, uh, in the joint committee meeting, or I'm sorry, in the individual committee meetings that were a joint committee meeting, uh, that my concerns were that we are voting a plan that provides flexibility and the ability to pivot, the ability to adapt, but also recognize that we had three weeks of what was going to be incredibly intense work for you and your team um, to make plans for the opening. The fact that we're rolling back in concert with uh, input from our LBOH as well as, you know, faculty, staff, administration, I, I think is a good thing. Uh, certainly with everything that will be going on at the end of August in Western Massachusetts, um, particularly in Deerfield, uh, with three schools coming back into <coughs> into session, three independent schools coming back into session and bringing in boarders from all over the country and all over the world. And in addition, bringing students in, day students in from Hampshire, Franklin and Hamden and other counties uh, on into Vermont and New Hampshire, et cetera. Uh, caution is is the watchword as, as we move forward, very definitely. Uh, so. I continue to thank you for your efforts. Anybody? I would, Trevor. Yeah, I would just like to um, to to thank Darius too. I, I do, um, you know, I I feel as a school committee we should give uh, Darius and, and the administration and and faculty as much you know flexibility they that they need um, if they see the need to kind of roll this out a little slower. I know people are anxious to get back to school and they're. Like like Darius just said, they're they're the families are trying to plan what, what are they going to do, um, but if 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 it takes a few more days, a couple more weeks to um, make sure that he feels comfortable that he can bring our our kids back and our faculty back safely, um, and it gives the teachers more time for professional development and make sure that they feel comfortable um, teaching in this environment and um, they they feel safe. So I just think it. I'm, I'm totally in support of the calendar laid out here. Um, I think I know Carolyn had had um, 
you know, had also mentioned that, you know, after 4th of July, you could see a slight uptick in, in as people go away on vacation or whatever, the end of the summer, everybody's coming back. I think that's really smart to just give a little bit of uh, more cushion there for, for everybody to, to come back, get settled in and, um, and be ready to go back to school and just give a little bit of more cushion there f for that. That, that seems smart uh, to do. So I I'm just, I'm in full support of this. Um, it, it makes sense uh, to me. So whatever, whatever he needs to get moving, I'm, I'm good with that. I'd just like a little clarification on uh, the what would say, uh, high needs versus vulnerable learners. I see at the bottom it has uh, high needs, mm -hmm. uh, listing a lot of different groups, including early learners, grades PK to five. How is that different from vulnerable learners? Is there a group at the elementary school level that is not considered a vulnerable learner at this point? Is, is sixth grade different? Is there, and I know you're still working at the details, but uh, if there was any more input on that, I'd like to hear it. The information on the bottom of the calendar, that's what's in DESE guide, guidance and it's copied verbatim, gives an idea of what they're determining as a vulnerable learner in special populations. And then each building is bringing it back to define it, to think about the kids and to do the programming for all the individuals um, that have found different kinds of difficulties. If it's access, if of the curriculum or other issues can all fall under that category. And it gives the principals and the staff at each school kind of a good wide net to capture those students that we have concerns about and want to support in the best way that we can. And then the last part here, if you may not know, regarding pre-K, pre-K, you know, public schools are only required to provide public education to pre-K um, for those with special needs or, um, so um, while we have a, a mixture in, in ours, so when you're talking about they are considered a vulnerable group because through the public school model, we are, you know, pre-K is, um, is set that way. So they're looking at them as a vulnerable group. A anyone else have anything to say? Um, I, I have not sorry, can it? Oh, I see. If, so if we're looking at, vulnerable learners going through October, we're thinking there'll be a group at, at DES that will not be starting until after that. Is that correct? There will be a group at DES starting um, in, during that vulnerable learning time period. Is that what you're asking? No, I mean, are there kids who are not considered vulnerable learners who will not be starting until November or later? How is no, no, the, uh, the, the no, the, yeah. when, we, when we start, yeah, those cohorts that we're talking about bringing back are all students broken down into smaller groups to okay. roll out those days. Okay. And, and understanding rolling out those days, there's, you know, we got new patterns, we had new student patterns. And the, the reason why we're doing smaller groups is we got to figure out um, all the different kind of things. We're kind of creating a new school in a way, in the sense of how we're doing business. And so we got to, if we start working a smaller group, I think teachers are going to be far more comfortable and then troubleshooting those. And that's the other reason why they're half days because they need the second half day to troubleshoot how we're doing, you know, basic safety procedures and classes with, you know, the six foot spacing and, and, you know, how we're doing from mass breaks to, you know, you know, activity times and those kind of things. A lot more thought has to go in there. So we're creating more time within that. So that's the, I know that there's a frustrating side. I know parents have to be frustrated at the, you know, um, the slower rollout, but that's, that's the, that's the logic behind it. <laughs> Okay, that sounds good. Thank you. Uh, certainly, Darius, you just uh, touched on. Oh, go ahead, David. I see you're unmuted, David. Were you going to speak or? Uh, no, no, no. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, I, you know, it's it's been a it's been a long summer. It's been a frustrating summer for everyone involved. Um, you know, we've seen a degree of divisiveness within the DES community, the Union 38 frontier regional communities. Uh, that is not something that we're used to. And I think, or you know, I'm I'm appreciative of all of the input we've received. 
my decisions and you know i can only speak for myself but the way i approach the decision making is a balance between the professional opinions provided by our staff faculty and staff the professional opinions provided by our administrators and state health leaders and local boards of health it's a also a consideration of the needs of the deerfield community the needs that are met by our education educators by the elementary school by our school systems in helping this community function it also looks at the families and the impacts that this horrible pandemic has had on all of us uh, and how how we can move forward uh, so i continue to support the hybrid plan. I'm pleased that the three weeks has led not, you know, has led to a more gradual rollout. It gives us an opportunity to do some remote early on to see what's how that's going. It gives us the ability to, you know, phase in reoccupation of the school. Uh, it gives our faculty and staff opportunities to work with small groups of children. And particularly, um, you know, some some of the more challenging population in establishing new safety protocols and, and new standards and practices within the schools. Uh, so I'm encouraged. I know it's got to be frustrating for parents at home, especially single, uh, you know, single fam, single head of households. Um, Two dual working families, uh, you know, childcare logistics. I know it's frustrating. We're trying to work through it. I know Darius and his team are trying to make things as workable as possible for everyone involved. And um, I hope that this community can come together now and work to see this through safely for everyone involved. So thank you. That takes a, does that take us through planning and scheduling for hybrid and remote models? We're down now to I just, go ahead. I guess, I guess one more question just to clear up. Um, <clears throat> when we get out to October 1st and, and on and in, into October, we have, you know, cohort B goes for a full day. Um, say, you know, I'll take the week of the 19th. So cohort A goes for a full day on Monday, Tuesday cohort B goes, um, then, then there's the uh, remote day, early, you know, remote day uh, on Wednesday, and then we go A and B again. On the days that cohort A is not being uh, educated, will they be doing remote on the following day? Uh, so the 20th, so cohort A on the 20th, are they working remotely or are they not being doing education? Excellent question, Trevor. So in this phase, students are in the building two days a week and receiving remote education three days a week. So okay. students will always be active and involved in the curriculum that we've built in either in person or yeah. um, through the remote channels. That's what I was hoping to hear. Thank you. That's great. Yeah. Okay. Um, what one other question occurs to me coming out of this. Um, uh, faculty and staff that are high risk, um, you know, and, and I think particularly of that, you know, the, the Andrea Callahan's statement and, uh, you know, recitation of what she's gone through since February and March. Um, is there provision within this that they are working remotely um, in some capacity? are able to work remotely in some capacity to to fulfill their obligations or what i i'm just um, from a staffing perspective wondering what what's out there so yeah so yeah so uh, staff members can apply for several different types of leave we uh shelly put on a presentation earlier this week to staff members could come on to understand the different types of leaves that are open to them from from the <clears throat> from a um, ada leave to a um, FFCRA leave to an extended an extended family um, uh, FF, 
all the acronyms, I'm, it's getting late. Um, but so basically kind of explaining what those things are. We didn't ask people to apply if they didn't think they had the documentation because we wanted to know what we had to work with there and, and what kind of accommodations we can do, whether the accommodations are, are remote, um, whether um, there's also child care issues that we're working through. You know, we have a lot of members with, with children um, who also, um, who have children and who may be attending our district or a neighboring district that no longer is open as well. So we have our own, you know, it's kind of in and on itself. You have, you know, we have parents in our own district who can't provide childcare and go to work and are also teachers. And so kind of, you can see how that is a, the multiplication of those issues. And as those issues, that's one of the reasons, again, the overwhelmness that my the administration has done, has had, is those things are coming in. We're trying to figure out how are we going to deliver the education in the, the hybrid model. Um, and we're really looking at, you know, doing a lot of team kind of, you know, approaches on that, um, you know, because we may have some teachers that are teaching remotely. Um, who, just because you're teaching remotely doesn't mean you're only teaching remote students. They could actually be popping into the classroom remotely to give a lesson with support from other adults in the classroom. So, you know, we do have some, you know, we have, a, you know, again, a master teacher who's a, who can, can, can work those kind of things um, out. Because um, you got to remember that they're, you know, the student right now, the way the schedule's set is the student is in, is in the building two days a week and out teaching remotely three days a week. So there's a lot of remote teaching that's happening in this model, you know, the way we have it set up. So it's two thirds of their of their education is still remote. So remote is really the emphasis. And then the getting the people in the, in the building in person is the follow up, is the connecting of the details, is the social emotional um, and, and trying to improve upon that remote learning. So okay. that kind of answer. Thank you. So, any anything else out there? Okay. So, CPAC concerns and questions. New business. Hi, curious. You want me to just? Sorry, if I, I was, I was, there was a, someone making noise, I muted them. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, Aaron Ferrandino, our Director of Special Education, is going to talk a little bit about some of the CPAC's, um, you know, questions and just kind of general overview of what's happening this, this fall. And I want to acknowledge um, Asia coming on as the co-chair of the CPAC earlier, um, and the fact that this got on the agenda based upon uh, a letter uh, with a uh, concerns about uh, the special education plan uh, that was sent to school committee over a week ago. Um, and we started to address that at the Sunderland school committee and through all these school committee meetings um, in which we're all in, I think there's just sort of ongoing communication. Um, and so there really has been sort of a change of, a change of focus or continued conversation through various school committee meetings um, because it seems to be the forum we're all in lately. Um, and I just wanted to note what you said, Ken, about um, the appreciation of input. And I think that's where I'm going to and um, how in this time it's so stressful that it's, it's easy to go to a place where it's divisive, um, but really and to just recognize that we're all allies here um, and we're all working together to a common goal and that all the input that's given and all the communication that's given, uh, it's just remarkable at the level of communication that's going on. And so I want to recognize the original letter uh, that was sent to the CPAC a week ago that got this onto uh, today's agenda, but also the ongoing communication by so many parties um, and so many moving parts. Um, so the original, the, the concern that was, was expressed that there was about special education planning uh, with the idea that, you know, the hybrid model was coming out and the remote model was coming out, but what we were doing for special education. And what I've said since Sunderland, and I know uh, Asia and Holly and others have been now in five school committee uh, listening to this and we've kind of uh, toned um, uh, uh, what we're doing, and that's why her her letter earlier this morning, or her ah, I'm tired. Her letter earlier uh, in this meeting. Uh, so some of the things that I just want to note that we're doing is ongoing uh, communication uh, and understanding that special education is a supplemental service. Uh, so special education students are general education students. So it was very important, as hard as it is to imagine, it was very important for us to have this model 
uh, that we've had for a while now of the hybrid on the remote models and working to design those supplemental models, uh, supplemental forms of service. Uh, and then there was the question of how we were defining the high needs students. Um, and that got a little complicated, maybe with some of the things that I said um, at Sunderland in identifying that our schools are so inclusive that many of the school districts around us are identifying uh, students high needs of those that are in substantially separate programming. That means out of the general education environment over 60% of the time. Uh, but we are really noting that a lot of our students that would have been in special education, specialized programs or out of the general ed population are actually included. Uh, so we can't just, we're not just going to make a blanket statement that our high needs kids are uh, just those kids in substantially separate programs. So uh, administrators, principals, Tina, Elaine, uh, faculty have all been discussing it um, and working with faculty and really looking at who are those high needs students. Um, and then we will be reaching out to families. I know um, I'm looking at Tina's picture there. Uh, already been reaching out to families to get their input, to find out what changes, if anything's occurred, if there's been heightened anxiety or stress in the families, to find out what's new in those families and to take that into consideration. We will then uh, put together a document after our faculty have time to talk about how and when those services will be provided. We'll be providing parents with a separate document to the IEP of exactly how and when the services and IEPs will be delivered. Um, Again, that wouldn't be a change in the IEP unless through our conversation with parents or for knowledge from the faculty uh, that there's been such a significant change in student need, it warrants a change in the IEP, in which case we would hold IEP meetings. So what this all comes down to is a lot of communication, um, a lot of input from many different parties, uh, continued communication, and uh, it's very exciting um, and stressful and tiring. Um, and one of the things that I'd like to just share as we move forward is we are all allies in this. And mm -hmm. if we understand that we'd be coming from different directions or maybe have our different priorities or different input that we want to give uh, moving forward, if we just all assume good intent uh, and share our input and our communication in ways, um, we can continue to just build uh, a district in which we have an expansive and strong continuum of services for all students. Um, so I thank uh, the CPAC for their ongoing communication to faculty, administrators, school committee for your work. Uh, and if you have any specific questions about special education um, and what we're doing, I'm happy to answer those. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. <clears throat> any questions from the committee? I guess not. Um, are we moving to executive session, Darius, this evening? If you'd like an update on negotiations, you are. I think I can see most everybody in terms of committee members. Are we interested in an update? Mr. Sharp and Carrie and Mary and Trevor? <clears throat> sure. Yes. Yeah, I would be. Okay. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, so for the general community, we are going to be entering executive session pursuant to Mass General Laws Chapter 30A, Section 21A3 uh, to discuss strategy with, with respect to collective bargaining, teachers and instructional assistants. Um, this will be a separate closed meeting when we reconvene, we will be reconvening to take no actions, only to adjourn our general meeting. Um, I want to thank all the public and attendees this evening for listening in and hearing all that's going on with our school community. Um, I, I'm gonna take one, one more moment to uh, to get on a podium, I guess, and, and just say a couple of things about community or continue to say things about community. Uh, as we've gone through this process, it's, we've had you know, powerful emotional stories and um, 
happenings described by people such as Andrea Callahan this evening and earlier people. Um, I I can only say from you know from my perspective, our community, our school community, really you know reaches out to provide support wherever we can. We're sorry to hear of these things. I, I you know I have family who have had COVID-19. I have a daughter who is a teacher who's wrestling with all of the issues that our faculty and staff are is wrestling with. Um, I, I fully get it. Um, and I just, I, you know, as Karen said, I, I hope that our community can now start to build, build back and remove some of the divisiveness and, and continue to work together at, on this issue. And, uh, we hope that the world and the nation as well move forward and we get to get our arms around this thing as quickly as possible. So sorry to get back on a podium for a while, but um, I will now entertain a motion unless Can someone else has you? comments. Absolutely. Could I interrupt you for a second? Um, is this Greg Franceschi? Franceschi. Yes. Franceschi, sorry. I am. Um, I am. Um, I thank all of you for what you're going through. I can't imagine how stressful it must be. I think that um, everybody in the community is really stressed out and anxious about this. And um, I just want to say something. And I also want to thank you for you know, really reminding everybody to go and listen to each other. Part. You know, we, we all have our opinions, and I think that um, Mine are very emotional. I have a son who's in school, and um, I'm worried. You know, I don't want him not to be in school. I don't want him to have a different education than all the other kids, or a lot of the other kids in his class. But if you would consider, you know, just for a moment, a little exercise with me in the part of yourselves that realizes the absurdity of, of this situation. In the world, there are 7.8 billion people. There are 783,000 people that have died. 175,000 people have died now in the United States. Our population is 382 million. So 7.8 billion people, 783,000 382 million. We're, we're doing something wrong. And I feel like we're following leadership that doesn't make sense and ignoring our basic emotional, intuitive understanding of the reality that none of us want to see any of our friends, teachers, children, co workers, anyone hurt. That doesn't have to be. And, Control who, who dies from this yes. without having contact, without having everyone entering the building tested before they go into the building. We don't know who's bringing what into the building, so we're basically putting everyone into a petri dish instead of keeping them safe in their homes and letting them survive the emotional trauma that it will cause them to be at home with their families or with support people. You know, compared to the emotional trauma of losing a parent or losing your, you know, a family member or friend. And I just feel like, you know, we're all on the same page in that concern, but we're forgetting that whoever is coming up with all the statistics about, you know, 5% and this and that, it's people. It's not, it's not percentage points. We're all, you know, on the same page with that, I think. So I want, I hope that you'll reconsider and give the teachers a chance to prepare to teach the kids remotely. They're gonna need a lot of time and, and training in the next few weeks to be able to pull it off. Otherwise it's gonna be a big mess, just like it was in the spring. And you're gonna lose kids because they're not gonna be able to hold their attention because it's a very challenging thing to suddenly go from teaching a class full of kids that can ask you questions and interact with you and get encouraged in a very personal, way to doing it through a computer but there's there've got to be you know there are obviously people who are doing going to do it remotely there are experts in our community 
who teach remotely already that we could learn from. And I just feel like we should be putting our 100% effort into trying to do a really good job of remote learning. And then, you know, in November or December, once things have hopefully improved in the, in the country as a whole and, you know, stayed stable in our area, we, you know, go back. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. That's all I have to say. Okay. Well, thank you, Greg. So, You're welcome. Um, <clears throat> um, executive, uh, with that said, uh, I will entertain the motion to enter executive session pursuant to M Mass General Laws Chapter 30A, Section 21A3, to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining, <clears throat> teachers, and instructional assistants. I'll make a motion or so moved. David. I'll second, Trevor. And we'll go to a roll call vote. And um, David Sharp. Yes. Carrie Etchells. Yes. Mary Raymond. Yes. Trevor McDaniel. Yes. And Kenneth Cutterback. Yes. At 8.31 p.m. We are entering executive session. As indicated, this <clears throat> public meeting will reconvene only to adjourn when we're done with our executive session. So thank you all for attending.